All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Paolo Peroni, who is not far from Venice in Italy. In fact, our first person from Italy. So welcome, Paolo. Thank you, John. Glad to be here, glad to be first. Yeah, absolutely. And Paolo has worked with Google, led three tech startups to exit and is the founder of Elevating Pioneers, who he now helps high growth pre IPO companies through consulting projects and training programs for their managers. And that's what we're going to talk about today is the concept of self managed teams. So, um, and Paolo, um, let's let's get let's get straight into it. Explain the concept of self self managed teams to people who may not be familiar with it. Yeah, absolutely. So picture this, right? If you're a company leader, you could be the founder, the CEO, CTO, COO, and so on. Um, imagine that the rest of your team, right? So from your senior management to your middle management to the more junior employees, they all know exactly what's expected of them and what they need to be doing day in and day out. And then of course, the more junior team members may ask for help to the more senior team members who are readily available to give it. Either way, this does not affect you, right? As the leader, what you're spending your time in is refining the company strategy and making sure you find the best possible way to communicate that strategy outside and inside of the company. Um, now, wouldn't that be a great way to, to lead a company? Yeah. No, that would that would be an awesome way. And I think the other part, too, is, is Paolo now with the the kind of way that work is changing. Right. I mean, we know the whole construct of work is changing. We have obviously during COVID, a lot of people went virtual. Now some people are virtual some of the time in the office, some of the time they're virtual all of the time. They're spread out around the world. They're not. So they've got this whole kind of hybrid organizations now, which I think you really need in an organization like that, you really need to have obviously clear understanding of what you can do, but you need the people who can manage themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. It's become very prominent. I mean, none of this is new stuff, right? I mean, I kind of coined this whole self-management team uh, concept with my consulting business, but it's all based on management best practices that have existed for a while. The thing is that like with remote teams, there is no way to kind of wing it. You really need to be very deliberate in the way that you apply these best practices. Otherwise, the whole thing falls apart, as unfortunately, some companies have come to notice now with the hybrid work model becoming prevalent. Yeah. So how much of this, Paolo, then falls down to uh, recruitment and making sure that you have the right people? Because the, the concept of self-management uh, isn't one that comes naturally to a lot of people because you know, they go into a job, they expect to be told what to do basically and, and instructed what to do but then taking that personal accountability and managing yourself I mean that's that's a very empowering step but you have to find the right people who either can be coached to that or are or are already like that yes that's an excellent question and actually the, the answer is uh, is a bit complex because there's two different things that could go wrong I suppose when you're hiring uh, for that type of people one is that you genuinely find the wrong fit. Like what you said, people that cannot even be coached into that. And that is the responsibility of the hiring manager or whoever is responsible for the resource to notice that quickly. And the way you notice that quickly is, you know, you, you kind of see how they do, you empower them. And then if there's something wrong, you quickly circle back. It's not always that if a person doesn't get it the first time, they have the wrong DNA necessarily. Um, you offer them support. That's your first port of call. You're like, okay, let me support you through this. But then, you know, there's only so many times you can support someone if they don't show good faith, right? Because it doesn't matter. Look, I've been junior too. I've made every mistake in the book. And I uh, was fortunate and I owe a debt of gratitude to the kindness of the people who were senior to me that took the time to help me once, twice, three times. Um, but I believe that in my case, and in the case of many good performers I've seen, the will shines through, right? If someone is genuinely doing their best and is improving day in and day out, that's fine. However, there are some people who are not that forthcoming and you can tell pretty quickly that they're kind of wasting your time. And after you've made a sincere attempt, you should let those people go. Um, 
It still befalls the managers, however, to give the right support. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not advocating whether letting people go or not letting them go is the right thing. It's costly for a company to replace people. So if you don't have to, don't let people go. But of course, if you have to, it's, it's, cut your losses. What I'm trying to say, though, is that like, so it's both a responsibility on the recruitment side, but also a responsibility on how you clarify the expectations and how you give support because you cannot motivate people. So they are motivated people you need to weed out, but you can alienate motivated people by either micromanaging them or not giving them enough support. So that befalls the, the managers to figure out how to do that. Uh, no, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great point. And I think that is because a self-managing team, I mean, just to be clear for everyone, clearly doesn't mean a team without any manager whatsoever. Uh, you know, there is always somebody in charge. But I think you hit on something there. The key part is is on the management piece is have you set it up properly? Have you set the expectations properly? And then have you empowered the people to to be able to be somewhat autonomous? Absolutely. And it all starts from the top, right? So that leader that I mentioned in my example in the beginning, right, who has this wonderful, wonderful life, um, it must be because they did something right. And specifically what they must do right are two things, right? One is to set the strategic direction of the company with, uh, beyond any reasonable doubt. And so uh, what, uh, you know, A.G. Lafley, the former CEO of PNG, wrote in his amazing strategy book called Playing to Win, he says that strategy is choice. So the leader needs to decide what the company will do and what the company will not do, which is the hardest part, because you want to do it all normally, right? But it's, uh, it's wasteful to try and do it all. You need to pick your battles. You need to decide where you're going to play and how you're going to win. And then that cascades. So let me give you an example. Let's say that a leader says that uh, the company's, one of the company's strategic imperatives is to always make the clients feel special, right? Let's assume this is a B2B company. Yeah. And so how does that then cascade? So for example, for the uh, product department, it could mean that the product people really listen to the client's needs and they make it a point to implement uh, the client's feedback into the product roadmap, okay? The marketing department might make sure they communicate to the clients that the roadmap is a result of their feedback. The customer success department may wanna make sure that they give extra face time to the customers and so on and so forth. Now, imagine a, a, a company that is exactly the same, but the imperative is to maximize profits. Now, this company might actually invest to, into scalable activities, right? So the product department doesn't care as much about the feedback, but they try to implement features that maximize the profit margin. The customer service department, they try to minimize face-to-face -face until it's necessary. So same potential company, but two strategically different approaches. But you see how what happens, what is decided at the top cascades to every aspect of the company. And if this is harmonious, because unfortunately many times you see one layer of the company saying one thing and other layers saying other things, you cannot have self-managing teams in that scenario because obviously nobody knows what they're supposed to be doing really. Okay, yeah. and and I know you're smiling, but this happens more often. Than no, no, no. I'm 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 smiling from experience, but that's uh, <laughs> that's a that's it. Uh, because I do I totally agree with you that um, strategy is everything, and I think sometimes people overlook that, and and not just overlook it, but as you said, is sometimes they create a strategy at the top end, right, and it never cascades down properly, or they don't at every level because today customer experience is is paramount and customer experience starts from the first time they interact with your brand to when they are a customer and beyond and if they don't have a somewhat of a consistent experience positive experience then it'll all over it'll just basically overwrite any other any good experiences they had once they have a bad one Absolutely. And like, you know, I'm glad you, you cited customer experience in the previous example. Imagine there's a CEO that says, oh, we need to maximize profit margins, but also give a positive experience. Now his people or her people may have so many difficult decisions to make that they can't possibly function, you know, and that's, that's a, a very common example of how things fall apart. Yeah, no, it is because if you, if you put people in that position where they, maximize profit um, but also customer experience and if you have a customer problem or an issue 
then they feel a little paralyzed as to how to deal with it. You know, do I refund them? Do I do something for them? Do I do something extra? If I do that, am I affecting profitability? Yeah, and you'll hear many times leaders say that they want both. This is a very um, simplified example. However, okay, you want both. Then what else do you want? Like, let's say you can max at maximum, you can pick three to five strategic imperatives of this kind, not more. If there's a sixth one, don't, you know, like, obviously, again, these are example numbers, but in my experience with my customers, whenever you exceed five, that's where these impossible decisions tend to happen because you could maximize profit margin in theory while giving good customer service, but you have to give up something else. Now, what would that be? You have to decide and you have to be clear so that the teams on the ground can make the decision day in and day out. Yeah, and I think that, and I think that's part of the issue, um, Paolo, is the fact that people hate making decisions. I mean, that's the truth. People hate making choices because if you choose one thing, you by default unchoose the other, right? And and that's sometimes where people, as you said, get caught falling between two stools because they want to do both, but they have to make a choice which one is which one is sort of supreme to the other. Absolutely. Yeah, you hit a good point. I don't know what it is, why people hate to make decisions, whether it's FOMO or whatever. I mean, executives are paid typically a multiple of the other people in the company because, yes, it's tough to make decisions. There's a reason why your paycheck is so big, right? So there's a, it's both a, you know, a award, but a reward, but as well responsibility. I think that there's also a difference between being deliberate and being opportunistic. When you make a decision what to do and what not to do, it's what you tell the company to invest in, what you tell the company to pour their funds into, their resources into, perhaps their training programs into, etc. right? It doesn't mean that you say no. It means you say no to everything else. But if a great new opportunity comes along that you didn't foresee, because let's face it, we don't have a crystal ball, nobody does. Mm -hmm. It's okay to stop and reassess, okay, did we make the wrong call here? Don't do it every five days, otherwise your organization would be like, you know, yeah, yeah. Into an order. but if you're reasonable about making strong decisions but being open to reconsidering them when sufficient evidence surfaces, you see that this shouldn't be too daunting at all. You just need to, but it's hard, right? I mean, none of this is easy, but that's, as I said, why executives are paid as much as they are. No, no, ab absolutely. So what are some of the, when you've worked with companies, what are some examples, I mean, not names, but just um, reference examples of where you've seen self-managing teams really excel and what difference has that made to that organization? Yeah, good question. Um, I think that one of the main benefits, so one great benefit is the, the, kind of the picture I painted earlier, which is the executive finally being able to invest their time into the strategy you know all those beautiful things that most executives don't feel they have time for because they're too in the business and putting away fires right and it's uh nobody likes that and also it's not profitable for the business because eventually they need their leader to have longer term and more strategic thinking and so the benefit is that the, the, the business can fare better and the person can feel more in control and more satisfied and feel like a better version of themselves and and feel the fire they maybe used to feel many years earlier, right? Um, another great benefit is for the people in the business because businesses are made of people and uh, you want to make sure your people are feeling as good as possible so they can contribute as much as possible, they can grow, they can become your managers where the business grows, etc. And people um, in a self-managing team thrive particularly because of what uh, Dan Pink in his book Drive explains very well, which is like the, the three things that motivate people uh, and propel them forward are um, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. And so purpose, clearly, if you have a very clear vision from the top that cascades down beautifully, you know your purpose, you know why you do what you're doing. Autonomy is because you are entrusted with a good system for diagnosing whether things are going wrong and a good support system should you need help but you're empowered to reach the result, the purpose, however you see fit. And finally, mastery occurs because, yeah, when you're made responsible of achieving your own goals with sufficient support, that's where you maximize your growth and your mastery. And so basically, you know, in this type of organization, everybody thrives, everybody wins, and the business future is secure because people are ready to take to rise to the next challenge when the organization grows and they need, you know, to, to expand the management team, to expand departments, et cetera. 
Yeah. And I just add one more. When you said purpose there, I think that's that's great, you know, purpose from the company so you can figure out, make sure that you're contributing to it. But also I think it's important for every team member to figure out their own purpose, why they're doing the job they're doing for themselves, not just for the company, but for themselves. Because when you get alignment between those two, then you have a really powerful, a really powerful person. Absolutely. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, I gave an example of how the strategic imperative from the top cascades into departmental objectives. Of course, then they need to be translated to individual KPIs. So first of all, you know why you're doing in terms of like what your personal goal is, not just a shared goal, but a personal goal. Yeah. And then there's also wider company purpose. I would argue that if employees understand why their company is doing what they're doing and why they believe is important, you know, um, then they can decide, is this aligned with my personal values or not? If the answer is not, you know, there's a lot of companies out there. Um, so you might decide that you want to move on, but there's nothing worse than have this tepid type of purpose that is neither here nor there. Um, someone once said that it's better to be loved by few people than liked by many. Companies should aim for that. They should only have people that are super dedicated and then, you know, the rest can find another a better home and that's okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And that's why I think, um, you know, having good people, having really good people, uh, even if it's just a small number, you can achieve, you can achieve a huge amount. Um, the other challenge I think, Paolo, that people have today is uh, not only setting up a self-managing managing team and, and getting all those pieces in place, but the fact is, people change jobs a lot quicker now. And the new generations coming in, their tenure, I mean, it, it's saying like the millennials are, a lot of them are only staying like a year and a half in a job before they're moving on. So you have to know how to integrate in people, swap people out. So that's a kind of a challenging part of it is that you're kind of constantly going to be maybe adding and subtracting from your team. Yeah, I mean, there's a, it's a great question. There's two ways I, I normally advise managing for that. First of all, um, if you do achieve this vision of a self-managing team where people feel autonomy, purpose, autonomy, and mastery, you will probably decrease your attrition. I say this first because a lot of people feel that attrition is an a necessary evil. It's true, but it depends on how big your attrition is. Right? Mm -hmm. If it's too much, then you need to reduce that. Uh, of course, there will always be some attrition, but again, the solution is still the same. If you have very clear strategic imperatives that cascade into very clear departmental objectives, that cascade into very clear individual KPIs, hopefully on top you build a good onboarding system by which, but first of all, these values and strategic imperatives also tell you how to hire and who to hire. And then when they come in, hopefully it's so clear and you add in a little bit of onboarding magic, you know, of course, you need to do some work to make the values come to life and to make things actually practically applicable, applicable, sorry. But still, at the end, uh, hopefully this will make all of that process of both recruiting, attracting the right talent that is aligned with you, recruiting them and onboarding them much easier than it would be with a more chaotic organization, let's say. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I think also then, as I said earlier, it, it, it's up to organizations then to be a little bit more flexible in how they, how the work is constructed. Because I think one of the things that uh, COVID taught a lot of people is that, yeah, people can work effectively remotely, but maybe not in the same way or the same, even the same hours as they would if they were in an office, you know, maybe they've got kids or whatever like that. So I think you have to have this kind of new kind of contract between employee and, and manager, particularly if you're going to be, if you're going to run a hybrid or virtual organization, um, whereby I sit down with you and say, this is, this is the optimal working arrangement for me. You say, okay, this bit works, that doesn't work, but we collaborate in finding the best way to, to work. And I think that's the big challenge now is that, you know, is that you have to be flexible and more creative in, in the way you construct your organization. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I believe that there are still some challenges with remote work when it comes to serendipity and uh, a certain type of innovation, right? And that's a, that's a big conversation. However, I am absolutely positive that most of the activities that keep a business going forward uh, can absolutely be managed with a remote team and with, as you say, like flexible but mutually understood 
arrangements like the one you suggest. And this is down to good habits and management should really make sure that, you know, when I talk about strategic imperatives, there's one kind that is like what we're going to do. And the other kind is how we're going to do it. So with, what is the quality standard? And that applies to internal work. So for example, don't have a meeting every five seconds. Don't just schedule a meeting. You know, so many teams, and I did too, when I was working in corporate, like my day was spent in endless meetings where you talk about everything and you accomplish nothing. And like, you know, what you want to do is do as much work independently as you can so you can enjoy the flexibility. You can work at midnight for what I care, right? As long as when we do come together, if we've all done our homework, if we've all read the documentation, if we're all clear on what decisions need to happen in that meeting, it can be a 20 minute meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be at a mutually agreeable time because at that point, you know, I would argue most people can find 20 minutes in their day to synchronize their schedules and get together. Finding two hours every day, much more difficult. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you an interesting one, Paolo. Uh, I worked in an organization um, back in Ireland, back in the day. And in our first building, we had one meeting room, right? And so rarely, rarely ever went to meetings because you only scheduled a meeting if it was absolutely necessary because it was, you know, there was only one meeting room for the whole company. We then moved into a building that had uh, two meeting rooms on every floor. I think we ended up with about 10 meeting rooms. Guess what happened? The meetings multiplied. Exactly, exactly. Now people want, oh, there's meeting rooms, so let's start having meetings. So I agree with you as you, it's, it's, good to, it's good to have meetings and synchronization and all of that, but don't go over the top on it because sometimes like meeting for meeting's sake, I mean, you end up spending so much time rather than doing, being in meetings. And obviously now with virtual meetings, it's become even easier to go, oh, well, schedule a meeting, schedule a meeting. Yeah, uh, the number of meetings that have no no agenda, no decision, but you know, this comes from the top. So to, 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 to quote someone famous, I mean, there was a time when, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg um, uh, in Facebook, he wanted the company to become mobile first. Remember, right, this was, you know, before mobiles, now we, we take them for granted, but there was a time for the younger viewers where uh, we didn't have these computers in our pocket all the time, right? And so a company like Facebook was a web-based website right a portal where you go and then all of a sudden he wanted to become mobile first when smartphones started to, to become prominent and so what he did every meeting he was in if the person you know presenting the meeting or if the first person to speak didn't start with a mobile first you know type of approach yeah. he would up and leave the room mm. that's it people catch on really quickly if you do that you know because uh, but if you tolerate they say that like you know a leader the, the standard you walk by is the standard you accept it doesn't matter if a leader says this is the standard if they are seen to accept a lower standard people will take notice of not what the leader said but what the, the leader does so for example in meetings what managers should do is Make sure the company knows that every meeting should have a clear agenda and a clear goal. By the end of this time, we need to achieve this goal, typically make a decision on how to move something forward, hopefully. If there is a, a meeting without the agenda, without the goal, don't show up. Yeah. The leader shouldn't show up and should, or should literally cancel the meeting. Whatever you need to do, it will catch on really quickly, believe me. Before you know it, everybody will know what they need to do. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's very true. It's, and it, it, that's a great part of leadership. Yeah, I used to once upon a time uh, in one company, people were always being late for the meeting. So um, I started when people turned up late, I just got up and walked out and that was the end of the meeting. And suddenly everybody started turning up on time. It's simple, really. Isn't it? <laughs> It really is. Well, listen, Paolo, this has been fantastic. And all of Paolo's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Paolo, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone, I'm Paolo Pironi. Uh, I uh, lead my consulting practice. It's called Elevating Pioneers. And uh, as we said a lot today, uh, we focus on creating self-managing teams. Uh, what I do is I work with uh, innovative companies, typically technology companies, uh, before Series B or up to 500 employees pre-IPO and basically I focus on merely um, a few topics one is people management the other one is company management so strategy and leadership like we said earlier sales and hiring and uh, some companies you know they engage me for as a executive coach for the founders or as a trainer for the teams or as a consultant you know to carry out projects but ultimately it's the same right these are the four topics 
Um, I can either teach people how to do it, that's the coaching training part, or I can do it for them, that's the consulting. So um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun and uh, it's, hopefully it shows that I love talking about these things any day. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, Paolo. It's been fantastic. So I would encourage you to look below the video and check out Paolo and, and all he does. And check out his, uh, I think you have a blog there too. So check out his blog as well. Um, so uh, listen, thanks again, Paolo. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again really soon. Thank you.